Okay, hey, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good? Good. Awesome, right? Hey, we, we made history this week. You want to know how we made history? Or you don't care how we made history? For the first time in over two years, right? In over two years, something happened on Friday night. Our softball team won. Yes. Yes, right? So that's some good news this morning, and uh, we praise God for that. And uh, so if you are a softball player, uh, come on, help us out. And uh, if you'd like to play, if you'd like to cheer us on, uh, we have a good time. We're not very good, but we have a good time. Uh, so anyway, that was good news that we won. I, I was there to uh, encourage our team, and uh, man, I was excited to see us. Uh, and we won, and, and the other team actually showed up, and we won. So okay, that, that's good, all right? And, uh, and they actually had enough players, and, and so that's really good. And so we had a great time Friday night. I think they play again this uh, coming Friday night. And uh, there might be a schedule in the bulletin this morning. But there's a little flap on the bulletin, right? And so if you can uh, tear that off, if you're a guest, fill it out. If you have a prayer request, fill it out. And uh, I want to encourage you to do something, okay? Uh, we're, having a, we're having the world's greatest barbecue dinner, uh, June the 9th. And I've already get, gave out 100 tickets, okay? And uh, I'm going to give the rest of these to Barry. And uh, he's going to be selling them. If you'd like to sell them uh, on behalf of our youth, $7 a ticket. And if it rains on June the 9th, we will have it on Father's Day, which is June the 16th. And uh, Hayseeds barbecue cooked over hickory uh, chips. And, uh, man, it is good, okay? Nobody around here can cook better barbecue than our own Chris Miller. And so uh, I've got tickets here. Uh, no, I don't have them. I'm giving them to Barry, okay? Uh, Barry, here you go. If you want to buy a ticket, if you want to get 10 tickets to sell, uh, we'll take your name, uh, your, the name of your firstborn, your serial number, your, your social security number, and all that information. We'll have all of that for you. And uh, so help us out. This is going to our youth so they can raise some money for uh, youth camp. Hey, I had a great meeting yesterday with, uh, with Chris Tolley and uh, our team going to Guatemala. Uh, Guatemala, love that, uh, that Central American country, and uh, we are going on uh, July 25, and we'll be back August the 2nd, and there's nine of us that are going from Hickory Ridge, there's four going from uh, our uh, sponsor church in Charlottesville, uh, Life Journey Church, and there's uh, three or four going from uh, uh, Liberty Christian Academy in Lynchburg, and uh, we're all going to be driving up to Lynch, uh, R Richmond, flying out on July 25th or 26th. Uh, going to Guatemala City, going to do backyard Bible clubs, going to do medical missions, going to do light construction, and uh, we're going to have a great time sharing our faith, and I'm excited about spending some time with uh, Chris Tolley and uh, Walt Davis. He's the pastor at uh, Life Journey Church. You saw a picture of him, and uh, man, good things are happening. God's doing exciting things in these countries, and we have just an opportunity to have a small, small part of it. And so uh, I want to encourage you to, uh, to help us go, okay? Everybody who's going on this trip, uh, they've got to raise about $1,300 to go. And uh, that's for the cost of the trip and their airfare and their housing and food. And uh, so if you can help us, we certainly will appreciate it. And uh, I'm so excited about what God is doing. God's moving uh, in the hearts of people, and God's allowed us, right, to have a small part of it. And I love sharing the gospel. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking child evangelism fellowship material, doing a five-day club. Uh, we'll have two children's teams. We have a medical team that's going, a uh, light construction team. And so it's going to be a great opportunity for us uh, to hang out together. We're going during a very hot time of the year, but that's okay. We can handle the heat. And uh, the, uh, the building you saw there is where we'll be staying, that white building. And uh, we'll be staying in the back side of that. And there's no air conditioning, and, uh, but it's okay. We, we can handle that. And uh, I'm looking forward to spending some time with our team. And I get to take my son with me. That's kind of cool. And I've taken all my kids on a short-term missions trip. I've taken my wife on a short-term uh, missions trip. Uh, everybody but Seth. I haven't taken him on a missions trip. Uh, his life is a missions trip. And uh, so anyway, uh, I'd encourage you, sometime in your life, right? Sometime in your life, take a missions trip. Uh, take a mission trip where you cross uh, the border of these United States and, uh, and just check out how the rest of the world lives and, uh, and you'll be blessed to do it and uh, you'll be blessed and when you come home you'll realize just how, how blessed we are here uh, in this nation, okay? 
All right, well, we're getting into our series again. We'll continue on in the theme of grace. And I hope that you, you have had a gracious week this week. And I enjoyed spending some time with my small group. And I love small group. I love hanging out with my small group. And uh, the group's not that great, but the food's real good. And, uh, and we have a good time eating. We have a good time fellowshipping with each other. And uh, I exercise my spiritual gift, which is hanging out. And uh, I love hanging out with my small group. And so if you're not in a small group, it's not too late. I encourage you to get into a, a small group. Uh, but this morning we're talking about the subject of of coming clean uh, within grace that abounds, okay? And in order to experience really true grace uh, and overflowing grace, uh, you got to come clean. Uh, we kind of hate that, don't we? you got to come clean. Uh, we'd rather just pretend that there's no issue. And uh, I'm going to give you, uh, on the subject of coming clean, the subject of forgiveness, right? I'm going to give you seven things that forgiveness is and seven things that forgiveness is not. I'm going to give those to you real fast, okay? And then we'll get into the, now this is a bonus, all right? Uh, I know some of you are looking for it, where I do the fill-in on this. This is not in, the, in your handout. I couldn't fit it in. And so this is a bonus, okay? Uh, just to kind of set the stage of where we're going this morning as we look at this subject of forgiveness. Uh, because everybody needs heavy doses of forgiveness. Uh, I was reading an article this week talking about the difference between a self-righteous person and an unrighteous person. Uh, which do you think is worse? An unrighteous person or a self-righteous person? That's self-righteous, yeah, yeah, because they don't realize they got issues, right? Uh, they're in denial, they're, they're in the pretend game, they're always blaming everybody else, they're holier, they're hard to reach, okay? As a matter of fact, when you look at how Jesus dealt with the self-righteous people to call the Pharisees, man, he was hard on them. I mean, he called them the white, sepulchred, uh, whitewashed hypocrites. Uh, but he always reached out to the unrighteous. One of the reasons I love prison ministry is because those guys realize there's nowhere for them to go except up, right? They realize they are messed up big time. And so when you look at this coming clean, everybody needs to come clean. When we fall into sin, we need to confess that sin. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, first you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then confess it with your mouth, right? then you have salvation. Uh, without that confession, there's no change. But, but let's talk about seven things that forgiveness is, okay? I'm going to do it real quick, okay? I stole this from uh, Mark Driscoll, okay? Uh, number one, forgiveness is canceling a debt. It's, it's letting it go, okay? I'm going to let it go. Uh, in the Old Testament, the book of Little Kids, I love it. The high priest would take the sins of the people and he'd put his hands on a goat, an old goat, transfer those sins of the people to the head of that goat, and then it would set the goat out of the wilderness, never to come back into the village again. Uh, that's letting that go, canceling that, 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 letting it go. That's what forgiveness is. It's letting it go. Uh, number two, forgiveness is removing the control over an, an offender that he has against you. You ever have somebody that, you know, you, they've done something to you, right? They've ticked you off. And you, you wake up in the middle of the night or you can't sleep at night because they're controlling. Don't you blow their mind? Just forgive them. Just forgive them. And when you do that, they no longer control you. All right, number three. It is giving a gift to yourself and to the offender so that you can move on. You'll never move on beyond the things that you refuse to confess. So when you, when you forgive... You're saying, okay, I'm forgiving, I'm no longer carrying this offense, and I'm going to be able to move on because I have forgiven. Number four, when we forgive somebody, we are removing the right to vengeance. Uh, these are on the screen, I'm sorry. Uh, I did put those on the PowerPoint. Uh, if you kind of go with me, I'm sorry about that. Um, at 3 o'clock this morning, I put them on there, and uh, so they're on there somewhere. I think at the beginning uh, of our PowerPoint in case you, I think they're on there. No, you know what I did? I put it on mine and I didn't send it to you. Sorry about that. Uh, we had this wonderful thing called Dropbox, and so when I was up, I changed all my PowerPoint slides and didn't put it in the Dropbox. Okay, uh, would you forgive me for that? <laughs> yes, okay, good. Too bad if you don't, because that's a, your problem, not mine, because I have said, I confess. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Confess. I messed up. Number five. Number four is removing the right to vengeance, right? Romans 12, 19 says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. 
Vengeance is mine. It belongs to the Lord. We don't have right to bring about vengeance. That's why God sets up government, right? There are consequences for sin, but, but vengeance is not ours. Vengeance is the Lord. He will repay. When we forgive somebody, we say, okay, I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to get vengeance. Uh, I'm forgiving you. Number five, justice is being left in God's hands when I forgive somebody. So, God, you're going to have to take care of this thing because I can't. I'm forgiving this person, and God's going to have to do what he's going to have to do. Uh, number six, I love this one. Okay, forgiveness is an ongoing process. And, and I don't know about you, but I had to forgive over and over and over and over and over and over again. Okay, it's just, I don't know why that is. I guess it's human nature. I, I forgive somebody, and I take it back and say, I unforgive you. I don't say that to them, but I do that, right? Anybody else besides me do that? Okay, I'm going to forgive you, but and then, then, then I reminded of something they did to me. So wait, I'm going to unforgive them. No, I can't unforgive them. Over and over again, okay? There is a process involved in forgiving somebody. Forgiveness is wanting good for the offender, the one who has offended you. Man, you know that you have forgiven that person when you don't get that knot in your stomach when somebody else sings their praises, Right? Okay, I'm good with that, man. Yeah, I'm going to let that thing go, and I'm good with that. And, and I'm, not equally, I'm not inwardly saying, well, if you really knew who that person was, you would have a different opinion. No, I said, man, you're right. That guy is pretty good. All right? What forgiveness is not? Okay, those are seven things that forgiveness is. Here are seven things that forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not denying the offense. It's not living in a denial game, Okay. I'll just pretend it didn't happen. I'll just gonna deny it didn't happen. Okay, it didn't, it didn't really happen. No, no, that's not forgiveness. That is insanity. All right? That's crazy. Number two, forgiveness is not enabling sin. Forgiveness is, okay, go ahead, I'll forgive you. 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 Yeah, yeah, I'm going to forgive you, but I'm not going to enable you to continue on sinning. Uh, sometimes I've got to do something. So, some tough things, okay? Sometimes I even have to break a relationship if, they get, if this thing's going crazy. Uh, because when you look at forgiveness, when a person confesses of their sin, implied in that is that I'm going to make some changes in my life. So we don't enable people just because we forgive them. Forgiveness is not a response to an apology. You can forgive somebody who will never maybe say, hey, I'm sorry. Uh, there's some people that are going to go to their grave with an offense against you. That's why Peter says, as much as lieth within me, as much as it's my responsibility, I'm to live at peace with all men, realizing that I may not be able to do that. But as much as it lies within me, I'm going to live at peace with all men. And so I can forgive somebody even though they may never say to me, I'm sorry. Number four, forgiveness is not covering up crimes that have been committed against us. Okay, if you're married to an abusive husband and he beats you, right, uh, you can forgive him, then call the police, okay? Uh, because we're not called upon to be an accessory to a crime. Yeah, yeah, I'll forgive you, and then we'll let the, the, the courts and the laws play out in this situation. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Number five, only God can forget sins. He buries them as far as the, in the depths of the deepest sea, as far as the east is from the west. I wish I could forget everything. Uh, but there's some offenses that I cannot forget that people have done to me. Uh, and I'm sure that I've done offenses to others that they cannot forget either, okay? Uh, so we all have an apple out of that barrel, okay? Uh, but when you look at this issue of forgiving, I can live in such a way as the offense has not taken place, and I can select not to dwell on it. I can choose not to dwell on it on it. Number six, forgiveness is not trusting. Okay, trust is a separate issue. Forgiveness is a gift. Trust is earned. Forgiveness is given even though it may not be deserved, even though it may not be asked for. Trust is always earned. Number seven, forgiveness is not reconciliation. All right? Just because I forgive something, somebody doesn't necessarily mean I will be reconciled. Reconciliation takes two people agreeing, right? Forgiveness it takes just one person saying, I am letting you go. I'm letting you off the hook. That doesn't mean we'll be reconciled. Uh, this is really important, I think, in family relationships. 
Uh, you know, you can forgive something that happens, but there may not be a reconciliation because that person that you are forgiving may not have any interest at all in reconciling and may not have any interest at all in getting things right. Uh, so as much as lies within me, I'm going to forgive that person, and then if we can reconcile, fine. If we can't, that's fine too. So those are the, 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 the uh, distinction between what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not, okay? Now, now let's get right into this whole matter of confession so that we can be recipients, right, of God's grace, so we can be drenched in God's grace. What is confession? Uh, when we think about this term confession, confession is gr- agreeing with God about our sin. Uh, that's what we are truly confessing. You say, okay, God, I know what I'm doing is wrong. I, I am confessing that to you, God. I agree with you with what your word says about what I'm doing. I'm lining up with that, and I'm saying, yeah, yeah, you're right, okay? Before I was in denial, before I was blaming everybody else, uh, before I was just, you know, but now I'm agreeing with God. Now, now, this is important. As you look at this issue of agreeing with God, the prodigal son, the, my favorite parable that Jesus ever told is the prodigal son. Sometimes I identify with the prodigal, right? Sometimes I identify with the older brother, the self-righteous one. It all depends on where I am in life, okay? When, when I'm out there messing up, okay, and I got to get things right, I identify with the prodigal. When I got things right and I think I'm doing pretty good, then I identify with the older brother, okay? But, but as we look at the prodigal son, he comes to his senses when he's in the pig pen, he's lost everything, he's lost his self-respect, he's lost all of his money, he's living the lifestyle of a very dysfunctional, crazy individual, right? He finally comes to his senses and he says, I have sinned. He, he got over the blame game, he got over, well, it's my brother's fault, it's, it's my father's fault, it's, it's uh, these people that put me in this, he got over that, he, he stopped blaming his friends, and he says, I have sinned. Now, the reason this is so important, that we steadily and on a regular basis confess our sins, because if we don't, we can become a prime candidate to fall in this realm of self-righteousness. I want you to get this this morning, okay? I do not believe that you will completely understand the righteousness of God and agree with him on righteousness until you first agree with him on your sin. Because your righteousness is as filthy rags, and it will constantly change based upon culture, based upon circumstances, based upon events in your life, based upon the way you are thinking. The heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? You will get into that trap of self-righteousness as long as you have sins that are concealed. But you don't even realize it. You'll do this thing. Well, I know I shouldn't have done this, but, but you know what they did. You're always going to find somebody who did a little worse than you did to excuse your sin. So, so, so we've got to line up with what God says on this matter of confession. Number two, or letter B. Confession is trusting that God's grace covers over our wrongs, okay? It's not his righteousness that covers, it's his grace, okay? It's not even his mercy. His mercy says, okay, I'm not going to give you the punishment that you have coming to you. But grace says, I'm going to give you something that you don't deserve. Not only am I going to withhold punishment, I'm going to give you grace, Max Lucado says this, confession is a radical reliance on grace. A proclamation of our trust, not in our goodness, but in God's goodness. Isaiah 61.10 says that he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness. That's all his doing. That's all grace that is doing that. Confession, letter C, is not pointing fingers or blame outside of ourselves. Uh, it's not say, well, you know, I, I did this because if you were married to the idiot that I was married to, you would have done the same thing. Uh, if they had done this to you, you would have done the same thing. That, that's the blame game. It, it's not pointing fingers outside of anybody else. I can't confess for anybody else. I can only confess for me. Uh, years ago, a guy came to his pastor and says, you know, i got a real dilemma, pastor. Here's my dilemma. I work for this company that, that builds boats, 
And, uh, and in building these boats, we use copper nails, right? Because the copper nails won't corrode in the salt water. He said, I've been trying to share my faith with my boss. And I'm listening to the sermon, and I'm listening to this thing about confession, and I realize I've got to confess to my boss, but if I confess to him, he's going to think I'm a big old fat hypocrite. He doesn't know what I'm doing, but if I tell him what I'm doing, it's going to ruin my opportunity to share Christ with him. And so the pastor says, what, 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 what you been doing? He says, you know, these copper nails that we use to build these little boats, I've been taking them home. <laughs> you know, they're kind of expensive. They're a lot more expensive than regular. I've been taking them home, and I've been building my house. My boat at my house with these copper nails. So you got to confess. I don't want to confess because you got to confess. So he goes back to his boss thinking, well, when I confess to my boss, that's it. No opportunity for me to share Christ with him anymore. I just blew it. You know, he's going to say, ah, yeah, that's how you are, a bunch of hypocrites. Yeah, there goes another one. He goes and he confesses to his boss. The boss looked at him kind of strange in the eye and says, George, I always did think you were a hypocrite. But now I'm beginning to see there's something to that Christianity after all. Any religion that makes a dishonest workman confess that he has been stealing copper nails is good for the soul. And it must be worth having. You see, that's what confession does. We're worried about all these little things. Well, you know, stop that, man. Be transparent, be true. And as a result of being transparent and true, people will hold you in high respect. Why is it so hard to confess? You ever think about that? Why, why is it so hard? Well, let me give you six reasons real quick why it's so hard. Uh, number one, it's so hard. To, it requires a lot of courage, Right? I mean, a lot of courage. And when it comes to messing up, it's a lot easier to take the coward's way than the courageous way. And, you know, denial is easy. Anybody can deny. Confession is courageous. Why is it so courageous? Because when I confess, I'm giving over control to somebody else. Man, they they may use this against me. Yeah, they might. That's why it takes courage to do it. Uh, You remember in Luke chapter 19, Jesus gives this great parable. He's got a a manager that's going out of town. He's going to be crowned king, and he has his ten servants stay behind, and he gives each of the servants one minute. And he says, I'm going to I'm going to give you this, and I want you to take this, and I want you to invest it. I want you to break a profit for me. When I come back as king, Uh, Then I'll see how well you did with the the investment that you have, okay? Uh, One guy takes that one little coin, and and he gets ten, right? Another guy gets five. One guy takes it, and he hides it, right? Puts it in the ground, and and, and so the master comes back. Now he's not just the businessman. He's the king, and he's ready to judge. and, And when he comes back, the guy who went and hid his talent said this. He said, I know that you are a harsh man. That's what he said of the judge. He said, I know you're a harsh man. And because you're a harsh man, I went and hid this coin. The master replies, I will judge you by your words, you wicked servant. Wow. The guy had, instead of Saying, you know, you're a wicked servant. He, God uses his words against him, the master's word against him. All you have to do is confess. I messed up big time. But he lost that opportunity because he didn't have the courage. He was afraid. You ever talk to people who are living in sin and they think God's a harsh God? If you think God's a harsh God, that's how he will judge you, by your own words. Number two. It's so hard to confess because none of this requires courage. It requires faith, a lot of faith. Okay, I'm going to take this step of faith. Uh, you say, well, how much faith does it require? Uh, not much, right? But all you got. Not much, but all you got. That's how much faith it requires as we go to this matter of confessing 
our sins. And, and, and at the moment of salvation, for example, you get a measure of faith, right? The more you use that faith, the more that faith grows. So, so it's got to be all you got, all of your trust being brought over. Uh, number three, confession is difficult because it requires a deep level of honesty. Some of us just don't like to get that honest. I like kind of having this mask on my face. I like to pretend game. I've been living in a pretend game so long. Now I'm going to confess and take off this mask? Oh, wait a minute. I kind of like the mask. I got comfortable with the mask. I got comfortable playing this little game. As a matter of fact, I'm so comfortable with playing this little game. This is the only game that you know I play. And if I take this off and I confess, then you're going to see the real me. I don't know if you're going to like the real me. So I'm going to stay hot behind this mask. I'm going to be dishonest with myself, trying to deceive you. But that doesn't work either because 1 John 1 8 says, if we proclaim to be without sin, we keep that mask up, we deceive ourselves. Hmm. The mask game, the only one deceived is me. I thought I was, no, yeah, yeah, the only one that is deceived is you. And the truth is not in us. So when we confess, the mask is coming off, and then what you see is what you get, but that is truth. Uh, number four, it's hard to confess because Confession requires humility. I mean, we work so hard to keep this appearance, and, and we, we, we uh, you know, this thing of pride. Pride makes us real tender of our reputation. You know, we put up this pride thing and say, well, I'm going to watch my reputation, you know. Uh, I, can't, I can't apologize. Then what are people going to think if I apologize? What are people going to think if I confess? They're going to think I'm weak, and I ain't weak. That's what they're going to think. They're going to think I'm weak. So I, I come from a family that doesn't apologize. I don't apologize. I don't confess. Well, well, how's that working for you? I bet you got a lot of friends that way, don't you? A lot of people in there type with you say, I want to hang out with you, right? The pretend game. Humility. If you stay humble, you won't stumble. That's the cool thing, right? I tell that to the inmates all the time. I tell it to myself all the time. If I stay humble, I will not stumble. But you don't understand, Pastor. I'm kind of bashful. You weren't bashful when you committing that sin. How come all of a sudden you're bashful? Well, I don't know. I'm just trying to fix my rep reputation. But wait a minute. You, you were not bashful when you shot your mouth off, but all of a sudden you're bashful when it comes to the matter of confession? Ooh, that sounds almost hypocritical. You ever notice how bold sinners are? So you call them in their sin, and all of a sudden they don't have a whole lot to say. Number five. If I confess, it's hard because it could trigger potential consequences. I might have to make amends. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, if I tell my boss I've been stealing copper nails, <laughs> he might say, okay, great, you got to pay for them. Or he might say, you know what? we got cameras all over this place, and you're marked. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to keep that camera on you, buddy. Can't trust you out of my sight, can I? Yeah, might lose your job. Potential consequences may come if I confess. Number six, it's so hard to confess because it requires change, right? Ooh, I don't want to change. <laughs> I don't, yeah, if I tell you I've got this issue, that means I've got to stop doing this thing because you now know you are, I've confessed to you, now, now, now you're going to keep me accountable, and, and it requires that I change, and I don't really want to change, all right? Philip Yancey, in his book, Reaching for the Invisible God, <laughs> describes the way God gets blamed for things in our lives. When we live in the blame game, we don't confess, God gets blamed. And he writes in his book, when Princess Diana died in an automobile accident, <clears throat> a minister was interviewed and was asked this question, how could God allow such a tragedy. I love the response. <laughs> the minister said, could it have had something to do with a drunk driver going 90 miles an hour in a narrow tunnel? tunnel? How exactly was God involved? <laughs> he continues on. He says, years ago, boxer Ray Boom Boom Mincini, Mincini, Mincini killed a Korean opponent 
with a hard right to the head. At the press conference, the, after the Korean's death, Mancini said, sometimes I wonder why God does the things he does. Wait a minute. It was your right hook, not, not God. So he continues. In a letter to Dr. Dobson, a young woman asked this anguished question. Four years ago, I was dating a man, and I became pregnant. I was devastated. I asked God, why have you allowed this to happen to me? Susan Smith, the South Carolina mother a couple years ago who pushed her two sons into a lake to drown them, blamed a fictional carjacker for the death, wrote in her confession. I mean, she strapped the boys, remember that, in the backseat of the car, pushed it into the, down the ramp, down the boat ramp, into the, into the water. This is her confession. I dropped to the lowest point when I allowed my children to go down that ramp into the water without me. I took off running and screaming, Oh God, oh God, no! What have I done? Why, didn't you let this, why did you let this happen? Why didn't you stop this? Hello? Now, now the question remains, exactly what role did God play in a boxer beating his opponent to death a teenage couple giving into temptation in the backseat of the car, or a mother drowning her children. Is God responsible for these acts? Uh, to the contrary, they are examples of incredible human free will being exercised on a fallen planet, and yet it's our own nature as mortal, frail, fallen people to lash out at the one who is not being God in our opinion. Wow. So why is confession so important? Okay, we, we talked about why it's so hard. We talked about what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not. It's so important because unconfessed sin causes pain. And more pain and more pain. You can bury misbehavior if you want, says Max Licato. But you can expect pain, period. You cannot escape the misery that it creates. I confess my guilt I am troubled by my sin, said the psalmist David in Psalm, 1, in Psalm 38, verse 18. You know, even if, even if we legislate and we legalize sin, it doesn't eliminate the pain. You know, that's what really is fascinating about it as you look at our culture. Remember back in the 60s, we legalized no-fault divorces. So, okay. No fault divorces. Cool, man, you go for it. No fault. Just say, hey, you know, it didn't work out. Not your fault, not my fault. We're done. Say, okay, now it's legal. There'll be no more pain. Those of you who have gone through a divorce know that is a lie. We legalize something. Let's take the pain out of this thing. Let's take the sting out of this thing and say it's okay to do it but the pain is still there. You know the tragedy about the homosexual agenda is they're pushing that, right? Let's legalize it all. It will not eradicate the pain, nor will it make the issue go away. Because you cannot go contrary to God's laws, even if it's legal in the eyes of man, and expect there to be no consequences. There is pain when we have unconfessed sin, and that will mount as we go further into our lives without confessing that sin. David was brought low in Psalm 38. He says, My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester, and they are loathsome because of my sinful folly. I am bowed down, and I am brought very low all day long. I go about mourning. My back is filled with searing pain. There is no health in my body. I am fe feeble. I am utterly crushed. I groan in anguish of heart. Psalm 32, 3 says, When I refused to confess my sin, David said, My body began to waste away, and I groaned all day long, and my strength, it evaporated like water in summer heat. So we want healing without confession, but we will not have healing until we confess, because confession allows healing. David, in his penitent psalm, in Psalm 51, 
I mean, he was over a year living in denial of his sin. Finally, Nathan the prophet confronts him. And you ought to thank the Lord if a Nathan the prophet ever comes into your life. <laughs> Embrace them and love them and say, thank you for bringing this to my attention. You know, crucify them. Don't cut them off. Man, because if you do, you're going to continue the pain. Nathan the prophet gives David a little story about a guy who had a lot of sheep and a guy who had one little sheep and the guy who had a lot of sheep took that one little sheep from the guy who had no sheep and was poor and said to David, what should I do with that guy? Stealing all the, you know, that guy had one sheep and this guy, takes, oh, I tell you what, he ought to be killed. That's what he ought, ooh, man. David, you just spoke your own judgment. Just like that servant who says, I knew you were a harsh God. Yeah, you, you, yeah, man, you just spoke. I don't know God was judging me. Yeah, yeah, he, he is with our own words. If you look at Matthew chapter 7, it says, judge not that you be not judged. We, we know that part. But that's not the whole context. That's just part. Verse number 2 says, for the way in which we judge others is the way that God judges us, okay? It's not saying don't judge people. We say that. Oh, I, don't, I don't judge anybody. I don't, uh, oh, you don't judge anybody. The, 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 read it, read, follow it through, okay? A non-judgment is a judgment. Oh, well, I don't think we ought to tell people how they live. You know, that's, that's, that. that's a judgment. Jesus says the way we judge others is how we will be judged. And so David confesses, and it brings about healing, and he cries out, and he says, Lord, create in me. A clean heart. Renew within me a loyal spirit. Don't banish me from your presence. Don't take away your Holy Spirit from me. That confession time. Now healing is starting to come. In James 5, 16, it says, Confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other. So God can heal you. Oh, confession brings about healing. When a believing person prays and confesses, great things happen. You can't be healed from a sin that you don't confess. It continues to fester. We're to confront our sins. James 5.16 tells us the, the context, confess your sins one to another. And notice that's, that's not everybody, but one to another. Okay, I think there's a good place for that, that accountability. Having somebody you trust, a pastor, uh, a small group leader, uh, a spiritual mentor. Uh, pick somebody that's a little longer the road spiritually than where you are and, and, and help. They can help you through that process of getting out of that fix. That's why I love small groups. I want to highlight two small groups, okay? Look at this next picture. This next slide shows one of our small groups. There it is. The fail small group is not failing, okay? This has the name fail in it, but that's okay. Uh, there's their group, and uh, quite an entourage of people in that group. And, uh, man, I see that. Was, oh, John. John the farmer is over there. And, uh, man, Mike and Nell, and, and uh, who else is up there? Robin's up there, and Jackie's up there, and, and uh, Melvin and Debbie, and, and uh, Pastor Bruce wouldn't let me take his picture. He was hiding, okay? But, uh, man, it's not about a small group. You get in a small group, and uh, you fellowship with each other, and, uh, you know, that's a great opportunity to confess. No, no, when we confess, right, we confess our sins. It says confess your sins. We don't confess the sins of others, right? That's called gossip. We confess our sins, right? <laughs> gossip is confessing somebody else's sin, okay? There's, there's an, so don't do that in your small group, okay? But you confess your sins, all right, and then you can be healed. All right, the next picture up there, I think, is uh, the Wilton small group, okay? Cole's here, and, uh, and there his, there's his group, okay? And, uh, man, that looks like quite the group right there. And um, you can't see it, but there's, it looks like there's food in that group, right? You guys eat pretty good? You, you, you must have learned that lesson from my group, okay? And, uh, yeah, man, reading the Word. Looks like, looks like Darren's praying there. Or, well, maybe he's sleeping. I don't know. Was he sleeping or praying? Uh, you, you know, uh, getting into fellowship with one another, and uh, man, that's, that's what small group is all about, okay? Uh, we learn grace in community. 
We learn how to get along in community, right? We grow as we're held accountable in community. And, and so as you look at being involved in a small group, uh, they will sharpen you, they will bless you, and, and it's a two-way street, okay? I'm going to go to a group. Uh, when I go to my group Tuesday night, I always get a blessing back, but I always go with the purpose in mind that I want to encourage somebody, okay? Don't know who's, who I'm going to run into my group, and I had a little clip in my group. Uh, I, I was going to show it, but um, my group's the... Uh, extremely, um, can we say dysfunctional, my group? <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, my group's a little bit dysfunctional. And uh, Dan and Kate, right, my small group leaders are here. It's at their home. And uh, we have good food. Uh, but man, we had a great time Tuesday night. Yeah, yeah, we shared about getting your feet wet Tuesday night. Man, tears were flowing. Why? Because in the process of our study, some things came to the surface, right? We didn't talk about anybody except ourselves. I said, okay, here's what I'm dealing with. I confess. There's an amazing healing that takes place when you're confessing to the right people at the right time in the right manner under the right circumstances. Galatians 6 tells us to, to, to pray when we're doing this, right? Be ready for it, right? Don't just brush in there with angels fear to trade, right? No, we're ready for it. And uh, we're prepared for it. That's why you, you ought to pray for your small group leader, okay? Every day. Uh, matter of fact, I want to give you a challenge, okay? Pray for your small group leader every day for the next seven days. I sent you an email. Hope you take the challenge. Did y'all get that email? Did you read that far down in the email? Confession is good for the soul. Remember, don't lie to the pastor. All right, at the end of the email, I put it at the end. I want to see if you read the whole email. Right? Because I know I tend to send you epistles through the email. Sometimes a little bit long, okay? Try to be as concise as possible. But I got the gift of gab. I can't help it. And sometimes it gets into my keyboard, okay? And gets in my emails, all right? But, uh, but pray for seven days for your small group leader. Every day. And then when you see your small group leader, after that seven-day period, you're going to tell them something, right? Anybody remember what I told you? You're going to tell them, right? that I've been praying for you for seven days. And the reason I've been praying you for, for you for seven days is because I really need to practice and you really need to prayer. Okay? Cool, right? You're going to say that to them. And after they laugh and chuckle, say, no, 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 I'm serious. I'm praying for you. You, you know, I don't think anybody can do anything more important for me than to pray for me. Everything else really is immaterial. The prayer of a righteous man, right? A righteous man, especially, right, I really want godly people praying for me. The prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It, it puts this heads of protection around that person you are praying. A, a spiritual armor around that individual. That's why I pray for my small group every day. Pray for my small group leader every day, okay? Pray for our pastors every day. Pray for our church leaders every day. Because the enemy would love to get in and, and attack, right? That's what he does. He, he divides, he lies, he destroys. You, you ever notice how the enemy works? He never builds anything. That's why you don't have the first satanic church of Chesapeake. Why? Because the enemy never builds anything. He always goes and he conquers and he divides. He tears down. He destroys. Liberals are the same way. Oh, that's another subject, okay? Oh, forgive me for making that political statement, but it's true, okay? You shall know the truth and it will set you free. But, but as you look at how the enemy works, he wants to rip things apart. So, so what are results of confession? I receive God's mercy and kindness. Yeah, so many of us want God's mercy and kindness without confession. David said, or, or Solomon said in Proverbs 28, if you hide your sins, cover them over, pretend they don't there, hide them, whatever, put them under the, the carpet, you will not succeed. If you confess and reject them, you receive mercy. Psalm 51, going back to the penitent Psalm of David, <clears throat> David said, God, be merciful to me because you are loving, because you are already ready to be merciful. There's the confession. Wipe out my wrongs. Wash away all of my guilt and make me clean again. You see, receiving God's mercy and kindness is a result of confession. Letter B. Restored relationships. Romans chapter 5. For if while we were enemies... We were reconciled. That means to be reunited to God. How were we reunited with God? By the death of his son. 
Much more now that we are reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Paul follows through with this theme in the book of Corinthians, and he says, not only have you received reconciliation with God, now your task as a believer, a follower of Jesus, is to have this ministry of reconciliation. As an ambassador of Christ, my job is to reconcile others to Christ and reconcile broken relationships. That's why Jesus came, to reconcile us with him and us with each other. Letter C, the results of confession is that I recognize God's power on display. In the book of Acts chapter 19, it says, Many of the believers began to confess openly, and to tell all the evil things that they had done. So in a powerful way, the word of God kept spreading and growing. All because God's people decided to confess. Wow. That's where the power is. Is your life lacking some power today? Will you be willing to risk being completely honest with God this week? See, that's where it is, being completely honest. That's what confession is, right? Confession is agreeing with God about my sin. That takes a high level of honesty. If you need to confess your sin to somebody else, maybe to, to bring about healing. And don't wait till you make reconciliation and then try to go back and get, no, no, that, that's getting the cart before the, her, the horse. Way back in 1822, right? About the year Joe Stone was born. 1822. Just want to make sure he's awake over here. I'm sorry, brother. I shouldn't have said that to you. All right, thank you. Man, see how quick that is? I'm glad I did it now because I've waited next week. It'd be harder. By the way, private sins we confess privately, right? Public sins we confess publicly. In 1822, a young woman by the name of Charlotte Elliott was visiting some friends in West London. In that circle of friends, there was a minister in the mix. They, they always show up, don't they? <laughs> right, you know, a minister by the name of Pastor Milan. Over supper, Pastor Milan is striking up a conversation with everyone, and he asked Charlotte if she was a Christian. When she replied, I don't want to talk about that subject, the minister replied, I, I don't mean to offend you, but I want you to know that Jesus can save you if you will turn to him. Several weeks later, they met again, and Miss Elliot said that she had been trying to come to Christ, but didn't know how to do it. Pastor Milan said this, just come to him as you are. Taking his advice, she composed a poem sharing how she came to Christ. Here are the words to that poem. Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me to come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. In 1849, William Bradbury took that poem and set it to music. The song is still popular today. It's called Just As I Am. The third verse contains Charlotte Elliott's testimony. Just as I am, though tossed about, with many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings and fears within, without, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. And the last verse contains this promise. Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve. Because thy promise, I believe, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. You see, that's confession. 
Confession is realizing, I'd love to have God's grace. I'd love to have his forgiveness. But it will never be triggered until I come to him just as I am. Can't clean myself up good enough. <laughs> we know this with salvation, right? And we get frustrated. We get real frustrated with people because they're thinking, i got to make myself better before I come to church, right? Isn't that frustrating? It's like, you know, you'd never be good enough to come to church. And to, no, no, just come just as you are. But then we become followers of Christ. Too often, we forget. Confession that we received or gave during salvation is the same confession that will trigger God's grace after salvation. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, written to believers, not unbelievers, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's where healing begins. And so this morning, I wanted to spend just a moment praying for you and praying with you as we look at this subject of grace being drenched in God's grace. Are you willing to risk honesty with God this week? Maybe you need to confess your sin to somebody that you trust, that you love, that's spiritually mature, uh, that can help you through that journey. Maybe there's somebody in a small group that can help you navigate that. If, if not, we have pastors here, we have elders here who would love to come alongside you and bring you through that process of forgiveness, that process of receiving God's grace after confession. I want you to stand to your feet. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed, we're going to pray us out. We're going to pray, we're going to take the offering, and then, then we'll head out. But uh, I really want you to look at uh, where you are this morning. You, you know, you really can't confess for anybody else. We talked about that. But, but maybe this morning, there's something that's been weighing heavy in your life. And, and today, man, you want to get rid of that thing. And you're taking the challenge to be honest with God this week. And you're going to be living a different life this week because you're going to get some things right this morning before we, live, we leave. And I'm not sure that how God spoke to you today, but, but I know he does. Whenever the word is preached, it will not return void. And so this morning, as you look at your life, maybe there's something that you've got to deal with, okay? Maybe there's something that you need to confess. Maybe there's somebody you need to go to later on and get things right. If God spoke to you this morning, would, would you do this? Would you just slip your hand up and say, hey, Pastor, God spoke to me today. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I see hands everywhere. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I see you in the back. I see you over here. Thank you. I see you here. Anybody else? I see you over here on my right. Anybody else? Okay, Lord, here we are. So much in need of your grace. So much in need of your mercy realizing that we don't get any of that until we first confess. Hey Lord, I want to confess my self-righteousness. It's so easy uh, when you're in the Word a lot to find a great answer to give a zinger to somebody. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really easy to do that. And so, Lord, forgive me for that. The Word of God is a, a healing bomb, not a whip. And so, Lord, I pray that, uh, that you'll forgive me for that. Lord, for all these hands that were raised, you know the issues and you know the struggles. You know the area they need to confess. And so, Lord, I pray they get it right with you. And I pray that you bring about reconciliation with broken relationships. I pray that you bring about healing. Lord, may we leave it once and for all as we confess this sin. And later on in the week, if we pick it back up, Lord, give us the courage to once again confess it and turn it back over to you. Lord, it's an ongoing process, and we are a, a piece of work, but we are a work that you have begun in us and that will not be completed until the day of Christ Jesus. So let us walk lives of holiness, walk lives of, of purity, quick to forgive, quick to confess. Lord, that's our prayer today. And Lord, now as we receive this offering, I pray that it will be used to advance your kingdom and your agenda, and we pray this all in Jesus' most precious in holy name, amen and amen.